place that law and our word there and Ruth showing what it was all about right there was for the Gentiles to come and help glean all 12 tribes. That Gentile is to reach out there and to bring back the lost of Israel back to their homeland. Shalom Kharim. Uh, it's good to be able to get a chance to speak with you guys and uh, the message tonight. You know, I, there's so many times that I, I, I make the comment, this is to my people, but in many times the, the Gentile brothers and sisters have said, this is such a blessing to us as well. Brother Steve, you have no idea. And God has really been dealing with my heart on that. Uh, th this is an hour that People need to wake up. I mean, it's a very serious hour that we're living in beyond anything that we can imagine. And uh, and I'm starting to see people wake up. I'm starting to see even Catholic people uh, waking up. So I'm seeing the biblical promises where it says, wake ye from among the dead, actually transpiring. And, and, and before I get into the gist of what I'm going to teach tonight. Let me just bring that subject back up. I, I was just talking uh, uh, last night to Brother Chris from Canada, uh, who does a lot of work on our intros, and um, and bringing that issue uh, to light. We were talking about uh, uh, the the governor of Israel during the time of uh, when Yeshua was on the earth there, and Yeshua had been brought in for judgment. So they bring him before Pontius Pilate uh, to be judged, and his wife sends him a message and says to him, have nothing to do with this man. I have suffered many things in a dream uh, today concerning him, and she was very concerned about what was going to happen. Now, scripturally speaking, or prophetically speaking, this of course, Pontius Pilate, the governor, is represents Rome and including Rome today. Because remember, Rome is uh, papal Rome is both political and uh, excuse me, political and spiritual uh, domination of the world. This is what they're doing. We're seeing that the churches. Uh, through the ecumenical movement, through the World Council of Churches, as it was called originally, now the ecumenical, uh, ecum ecumenism, you might say. I'm not very good with these words, but uh, the churches have joined in with the Catholic Church, and it is a major growing movement, as we've seen with Kenneth Copeland when Pope Francis sent the messes, message uh, recently to, to his group there and all the big leaders there and how they just fall right into this. Well, let me just say this to Kenneth Copeland and all the group that was there. You're written prophetically right in the words. You're seeing history repeat itself. I can only hope and pray that you will be like Pontius Pilate's wife who wakes up from a dream and realizes that Rome is about to crucify the word. That is what she saw. She represents the church and the church, because she's a Gentile, you got to remember she's a Gentile, but the problem is she's already married into the church. She's already married into Rome. And she wakes up from a horrible dream recognizing that Rome is about to condemn the word, the word of the hour, Yeshua HaMashiach, and about to have him crucified and put to death. And it was a fearful thing. I can only imagine the fear this woman must have undergone. And, uh, and I think of, think of that today because as the churches are married into Rome now and they're just, just falling on just like nuts. Uh, I read a news article the other day about um, uh, a, a, a big famous church in Sweden and the, and the head of this church here uh, with, with several thousand in the congregation there. He and his wife become Catholic, uh, a, a charismatic type of movement church there. 
Uh, so we see that Pontius Pilate, his wife, represents the churches that have married into this. So very sad indeed. I'm, I'm hoping, though, that people that are in these churches will begin to wake up. The scripture says, wake ye from among the dead. Uh, in fact, let me just see if I can uh, pull that up real quick for you. Wake. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Yes, it's actually in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See, they're sleeping among the dead. And uh, so, yes, very serious hour that we live in. Uh, now, the message that I'm speaking today, it, this does speak to the Jewish people. My brothers and sisters, my kindred of the flesh, uh, I wanted to speak to you. Uh, a familiar scripture with Christians as well as Jews alike. Um, and yet something that I know Christians know of already, but I'm going to take this to a different level uh, that of understanding that it might be a blessing to all that listen and hear this. Uh, so if you have your Bible, if you would turn with me to Exodus, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, Leviticus. And uh, um, no, I am sorry. Exodus. Let's go to Exodus first. I have several places marked. If, well, in fact, let me go ahead and just let you know. We're going we're gonna to look in Exodus chapter 32, uh, verse 10. We're going to be going to Leviticus chapter 16. We're going to look at Psalm 106. Uh, and then I'll be talking to you uh, from scriptures from the book of Genesis, uh, the story of Joseph as well. Uh, starting with Exodus uh, 32, uh, and let me just back up to verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go get, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, These are thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn against them and that I, might, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doest thy wrath burn against this people whom thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should Egypt speak and say, um, in an evil hour did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains? and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce anger and relent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel for thy servant, to whom thou didst swear by thine own self, and didst say to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. In all this land that I have spoken of, will I give your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented of the evil which he had thought to do to his people." Now, just keep this in mind. Now, for the Jewish, my Jewish brothers and sisters, many Christians would say, well, Yeshua did the same thing. Um, he threw his self in the breach for Israel. We're going to look at that in depth, though. Uh, let me take you to Psalm 106, because David mentions this as well. Let's start with verse 21. They forgot God, their Savior. Hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, let me back up just a little bit more, though. They envied Moses, verse 16, also in the camp, and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. They, the earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of uh, Ibaram, and fire was kindled in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf of Horeb and worshipped the molten image Thus they change their glory into similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. See, who was their Savior? It was Hashem, the God of Israel. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said he would destroy them. 
had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. My gosh, I mean, that is so powerful for God to make such statements there. Um, and uh, so very, very serious in, indeed to see that God had his servant stand in the breach. Now, I want to take you now, this is the very critical part of the scripture that you need to see. And this is found in Leviticus um, chapter 16, and I'm going to begin around verse 7. And for his house, and shall now let me back up just a little bit here. Now, this is the sacrificial commandment that God has given for the sins of Israel. Okay, and the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of his, uh, the death of uh, the two sons of Aaron, when they came near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, "Speak to Aaron thy brother that he come not all the times into the holy place within the veil before the covering, which is upon the ark, that he, that he die not." Very serious. For I appear in the cloud upon the ark. And by the way, let me just say this here: there's something there. I was reading this earlier, and there's something here, and I don't know what it is, but I just know the Lord wants, uh, wants us to know something there. So just pray for me. I'm going to go back and just see if the Lord will make that known. Uh, Thus shall Aaron uh, come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he bathe his flesh in water and put them on. And he shall take away, excuse me, take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering. This is very, very important right here. He takes two kids. See, watch what it says again. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel Two kids of the goats. See? What did God say to Moses? From among your brethren, I'll raise up a prophet. Two goats of the kids. Hmm. For a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, <clears throat> and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the goats, excuse me, the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door, to the door of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for, upon, uh, for Azal, excuse me, Azaz, Azazel. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer it for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot uh, fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over him, and to let him go to Azazel into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of a burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the covering that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock. Now notice, see, these things are to happen so that he doesn't die. So let me just back up just a little bit. Look at that carefully now. That the cloud of the incense may cover the covering that's upon the testimony that he die not. Let's back it up a little bit further. See, 
offering which is for himself, and he shall take a censer full of burned coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it inside the veil, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the covering that is upon the testimony, that he die not. So many things goes through my heart right now just reading this here. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his fingers upon the covering eastward. Before the covering shall he sprinkle of the blood. Mm. Seven times, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring its blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the covering and before the covering and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tent of meeting that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tent of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out of the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about it. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his fingers seven times, cleanse it, hallow it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. And he has made an end of atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting and the altar. And he shall present the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of an appointed man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon it all their iniquities to a barren land. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he had went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth to offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of his people, and make atonement for himself and for the people, and of the sin offering, shall he burn upon the altar unto the goat, and, and he that let go the goat of Azaz, Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards come into the camp, and the bullock for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood who brought to make atonement in the holy place. And should, okay, that's, I think that's enough there right now to kind of give you the gist of it. Several things. Let me just kind of just start sharing with you here to what we have to understand. Um, those of you that have listened to a lot of the different messages, especially when I teach on the story of Joseph there, I share with you where I believe that these two goats come from, where that law originates from and why that law originates from. But for my Jewish brethren... I have to really bring a challenge to you to, to have you think about this. And to the Christian people, I have to make a challenge to you as well uh, because many Christians believe today, not, not many that follow this ministry here, but many of, the, many of the other Christians that know no better believe that Israel is basically done all the Jews, unless they believe that Yeshua is Messiah, they're just totally done. Um, now they do, I, and I say that, but a lot of those Christians believe that their Messiah will reveal himself in the last days here. They'll end up believing and then everything will be all right. They'll get saved. But what about the Jews for the last 2,000 years? What happens to them? Where do they go? Because they never believed Yeshua to be Mashiach, according to most Christian theology, they're lost. Quite frankly, in their opinion, they've gone to hell, so to speak. Well, the scripture doesn't teach that. And, but I have to, so that's the challenge for my Christian brothers and sisters. Scripture really doesn't teach that. And we're going to set that straight. 
For my Jewish brothers and sisters, I have a question for you, and that is, our sacrificial ceremonies ceased, had to have ceased in 70 AD for at the very latest as far as modern times from the time that Yeshua was on the earth. I can't tell you exactly right off the top of my head uh, what year that was in our own calendar, the Jewish calendar, but we'll just say for the modern time uh, scenario, 70 AD when Titus came in and he destroyed the temple, we no longer had the annual uh, requirement of Hashem, of the offering of the, 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 the goat for the sins of the people, the sins of the children of Israel, for Aaron, for his household, and for the children of Israel. Neither is the scapegoat there to have our sins confessed upon him and taking, taken out to Azazel and turn loose. So if this has not happened, we would have to conclude as well then what has happened to our ancestors for the last 2,000 years. I mean, if we're going to take and to believe the law of God and to believe the Torah and to know that the Torah is true, and it is true, the Torah requires the sacrificial lamb to be offered up for the sins of Israel, for Aaron, for the priest, for the priest's household, and for Israel as well. Now that's Torah. Plain and simple, we cannot get around that. And the sacrifice or the goat that, that the lot falls upon that is to be taken and to turn loose if our sins are to be confessed upon him and taken into the wilderness and set free, where's he at? These practices are not done. They're not kept. And if they're not kept, then how can we expect atonement? Now, I know it's written in, 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 the, in the Tanakh that our exile that we were in, and I wish I had that in front of me. I don't have it in front of me at the moment here, but I will try to bring this out in another video for you. The, our exile would atone for the sins that we had done. But now, let me, let, me just, let me challenge you with this here. Daniel says, the prophet Daniel that there would be 70 weeks determined upon our people. Now, we, uh, it's obvious that the 70 weeks have never been fulfilled because it brings an end of sin, a completion of transgression. Let's just take quickly, let's take and look at Daniel's uh, words here. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 uh, and verse, uh, I want to say it's first. Uh, let me just get that for you just real quickly. 70 weeks are decreed, verse 24, concerning thy people and concerning the holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to, to atone for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and profit and to anoint the, the most holy place. Uh, now, come on now, wait a minute now. To anoint the most holy place. Isn't that what Aaron was to do? Isn't that what the Levitical law says for him to do? Going into the most holies? Sprinkling the blood? Putting the blood on the horns of the altar? On the covering? And yet we know that the Ark of the Covenant was not in the temple when the temple was destroyed. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that suggests some time back, in fact, quite a bit of some time back, long before 70 AD, the ark was moved and hidden as well. In fact, when this man Yeshua was taken and was found uh, condemned by the, uh, by the chief rabbi, by uh, Caiaphas and turned over to the Romans and condemned by the Romans. There was, the Ark of the Covenant was not there either then. When God had Moses 
stand in the breach according to David. He stood in the breach for the people of God when God was ready to destroy our forefathers in the wilderness journey because they, we'd become stiff-necked. They didn't believe God. In fact, Moses, for that time that he was gone, this is when all this happened. He's gone up onto the mountain to get the commandment of God and we don't have the patience to wait. Our forefathers didn't have the patience to wait for God to send back his commandments, his words to his prophet to give to us. Instead, you know, we just got into that little, our forefathers got into that little rut. No, we got we to gotta do it our way. We've been doing this for the last 2,000 years, trying to do it our way. The temple has not been set up. The sacrifices are not being offered. So if the sacrifices are not being offered, technically, according to the law, there is no remission of sins. But yet Daniel prophesies that there would come a time where there would be to make an end of sins and to atone for iniquity. Now, if it's going to make an end of sins and atone for iniquity, something, something greater than these two lambs according to an annual sacrifice set by Levitical law, according to God's own word, has got to come to an end as well. And the sacrificial lambs, when things end, are, 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 so, all right, let's just look at that as a point right there. That, that in itself, think about this. 70 weeks of the decree to, uh, concerning thy people, concerning the, thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to atone for iniquity. If, if this scripture is fulfilled, there's no more need then for sacrificial offerings, is there? There's no more need for the Levitical law right here that requires of God, that, that God's requirement that says, take the two goats, cast lots upon them. Well, you know, that's kind of funny. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, there were lots cast upon a man named Yeshua. In fact, uh, according to the word of God, the, you know, the, it was to be uh, anointed uh, inside the Holy of Holies. There, there was to be an anointing done of the sweet incense, the perfume. 2,000 years ago, there was a little lady that believed that Yeshua was Mashiach and she took the very expensive oils and she anointed him. Now, I challenge you as my Jewish brethren to really take this into serious consideration because the law plainly says this is the way this is to be done. Now, we've just up, I guess, the rabbinical brethren have just decided, since there's no temple, God has just decided, okay, no big deal. Uh, we don't have to worry about doing the goat offering. We don't have to worry about having the scapegoat, so to speak, being taken and the uh, sins of Israel being confessed and taken out in the wilderness and let go. Uh, I guess God has just forgot his law now because, uh, you know, our people went into exile, so everything ends, everything ceases. I don't think so. And that's true. We went into Babylonian exile. All these things were stopped then as well. Certainly it was. Uh, I mean, we can, we can argue this, and this is probably the argument now. But the thing is, is God puts a prophecy that lays before us that Moses stood in the breach. And Moses says that the Lord thy God shall raise up a prophet from among your brethren like unto me. Hmm. If the prophet is going to be like Moses, then he will stand in the breach like Moses as well. In fact, if we look at the story of Joseph, when Joseph, who was a dreamer, he saw visions or had dreams, 
He had dreams that his brethren would come and bow before him. He had dreams that his, the, the interpretation thereof, we would say, uh, that his mother and his father would come and bow before him, which, by the way, is not technically fulfilled because his mother was not living when his brethren came down and his father came down. So my question then to you is then, did the dreams actually apply to Joseph or did they apply to someone else? Or it is a compound fulfillment. So we have a prophecy left unfulfilled. But getting back to the story of Joseph, though, what happens? He has uh, Benjamin is left back at home. His 10 brothers are out doing the sheep up in Dothan, and uh, his father sends him out to go check on his brethren. And we know that even in the Christian community, they type that as being Jesus is sent by the Father, you know, I'm not into multiple gods, okay? So don't worry about that. But still the type is perfect in the respect that God can be what he chooses to be. So therefore, God himself comes to see. But in the story of Joseph, his father sends him out to check on his brethren to see how they're doing. When they see him coming afar off, they say, uh, here comes that dreamer. Let's take and kill him and see what happens of his dreams then. I can just imagine 2,000 years ago, maybe that was some of the opinion of the Pharisees or the Sadducees even uh, regarding Yeshua. But nonetheless, he comes and his brethren take him and they bind him and they throw him into a pit. Now, interesting, Reuben is the one that pleads for his life. They were wanting to kill him, the rest of the brothers. Now, I find it kind of ironic that Reuben's name means behold a son. So every time they would argue with Reuben about the fate of Joseph, they kept saying, behold a son, behold a son. You know, it's kind of like they talk about subliminal messages and advertisements and things. A little, a little flash, all of a sudden, you know, they, they you know, you, you see something like some kind of food, and you don't see it with your with your natural eyes, but your subconscious picks up that subliminal message, and then it's stuck in your head. Well, in this case here, the subliminal message was quite obvious. God kept having them say, "Behold a son," when they would argue, "Yeah, Reuben, yeah, behold a son." God's prophetically laying out a chart for you. But anyway, they take and they sell him out. He goes down into to Egypt where he's sold again to Potiphar and Potiphar takes. Uh, eventually we see that he's falsely accused. He's thrown into prison. All this, the types that we hear so much in Christianity that Jesus was falsely ac accused um, uh, we say that he goes to hell as Joseph went into the prison. He's, uh, he's uh, the, the butcher and the baker, the two thieves on the cross. Uh, he's raised to the right hand of Pharaoh, and then no one can come to him except by, by the life of, um, you know, they come to, through, through Joseph first. Now, I just kind of quickly just mentioned that in there, but the thing that I find ironic is when his brethren come down, when the famine begins to set in, in other words, there's like a 2,000 year gap there, we would say, not in reality, but in the story of Yeshua compared to the story of Yosef, there is a, it, the, the typology is a 2,000 years. Jesus came. He was rejected of his brethren. He was, uh, was thrown in the ditch, so to speak. In other words, he was killed. He was put into a, to, the, to the tomb. Uh, the tomb ended up being empty. He rose up and he uh, went to heaven and he sits to make intercession upon our confession. Uh, Joseph was the judge of the land and every man that had a matter went before him. Uh, all the types and so that we can see here, very interesting. Uh, I bring out types that, that other people have not considered, and that is, uh, uh, like, for example, when his brethren, he puts the money back in their bag and they're on their way back home. In the hotel is where they first discover. They begin to recognize their sins. And, of course, where was Yeshua first rejected? In this womb of his mother. Uh, you know, things of this nature here. These are little little tidbits here. Uh, beautiful little insights that we that we can glean from this. Now, 
The point, though, that I'm wanting to bring out in the story of Joseph, though, is that once his brethren do come down, um, first he throws them into prison for three days. Speaking of Hosea's prophecy, in the third day, we shall have life and we shall live in his sight. In the third day. See, there's the three days. They're bound. He binds Simon until they bring Benjamin back, showing that Israel would have their hearing bound. Because see, Simon, Shimon means heard or I heard. And so the hearing is bound until what? Until Israel is reestablished as a nation. And the house of Judah is once again uh, there. Benjamin types the Jews that were never guilty of his blood, the blood of Yeshua, but types that group there, but is found holding the cup because Joseph puts his cup in Benjamin's bag. The innocent brethren has him, you know, has him held responsible. Now, ironically, now let's just look at this technically here now. According to God's word, There has to be sacrifice for sin. That's plain and simple. Joseph's brothers should have come to an end. The ten brothers. Now, not Benjamin. Benjamin was not guilty in all of this. But technically, because Joseph's brother, his other ten brothers, never uh, confessed to what they had done. They just sold their brother out. Then they take a goat and they kill the goat and they put the blood upon Joseph's coat, the coat of long sleeves, and they send this back to their father and they said, tell us whether or not this is your son's coat. Hiding their sins. At least they think they're hiding their sins. Remember what the Jews did to Yeshua 2,000 years ago. They said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Now, had God not applied the blood of Yeshua to the children and to those that were uh, counting him guilty and having him turned over to the Romans to be crucified, we would, there would be no return of the house of Judah in modern days. Now, not, in this case, not in the house of Israel because the house of Israel was not guilty. Now, there was, just like Benjamin was not guilty. And the same thing with the other 10 tribes back during the time of Joseph. Had they not offered, taken that goat and poured that blood upon that goat and God himself used it as a sacrificial blood, we would be 10 tribes less. There would only be two tribes in modern days. But it's evident that God had accepted that blood or we wouldn't be here today. In fact, because of accepting that blood as that atonement, it opened the way for his brethren to repent of what they did. Now you can see why in the story of Ezekiel, uh, in in Ezekiel, uh, I guess around 38, where it talks about the uh, valley full of dry bones, and they said, our hope is lost. See, they've died. They know where they went wrong. They know that Yeshua done come, that Mashiach has already come, and they were not there in the land when he came. Only the house of Judah. Because of their own sins. So they feel like their hope is lost because of that. But God prophesied to the house of Israel, even back then that went into exile, 723 before Yeshua come on the earth, and prophesied to Ezekiel and says, can these bones live again? All those that had died back then. And God says, yes, they can. And he says, prophesy unto them. And God will bring back even the lost house of Israel to see and to hear the gospel of Yeshua because the promise was to them as well. He's obligated to. We see it in the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph is the scapegoat whom the lot fell on. And the sins of Israel were in his bosom. Whether they confessed it or not, they laid their hands upon him. 
They placed their sins upon their brother and he bore their sins far from their sight and from the sight of their father. This is why God had Moses put this in the law. This is why the law in Leviticus 16 exists. Because of the story of Joseph. Not only that, it's because God knew that when Mashiach would come, and Yeshua was that Mashiach, that he would have to fulfill both the sacrificial lamb that would die, that at our forefathers' own request, let his blood be upon us and our children, that God would take and the, the evil that we meant that our forefathers meant, and he would apply it for the sins of our fathers and their children for the next 2,000 years. And then Yeshua, like Joseph, although he died, he rose again. He carried the sins of Israel far away. They placed their hands upon him and delivered him to the Romans. Do you wonder why then, my brothers? I mean, someone had to stand in the gap. We have not been able to offer that sacrifice anymore for the last 2,000 years. Isn't it kind of ironic? And then that, in that case there, Ron Wyatt, who says that he discovered the ark under Golgotha, as well as where he found the place where the cross actually stood in the hole, and down in there, prophesied of it, and then found the ark under there, with a brown substance on there, that you can go and find out for yourself, my rabbinical brethren that live in Israel, that when this evidence of this brown substance was taken to an Israeli lab before Israeli Jews, this brown substance came to life and it was blood. Bearing 23 chromosomes of his mother and one chromosome of the father. Genetically impossible, it would seem. A kinsman redeemer is what we had need of. We have need of of a restoration. We had need of someone that would stand in the gap as Moses did. Why? Because God knew for the next 2,000 years we'd be without a sacrifice. No wonder why the ark wasn't there. God knew where he would be killed. God knew where he would have to offer up his son like Abraham was going to offer up his. God knew that the blood would have to be sprinkled upon the covering of the ark. God knew that everything that was commanded had to happen, so he had to move the ark. And the Holy of Holies covered the ark, stood over the ark, and hung on a cross to fulfill Leviticus 16. Let's think about it. Let's pray about it, brothers. We're in a late hour. Baruch Hashem. He is coming. Baruch Abba HaMashiach. The God of Israel bless you.